<laughs> See how long it took. Good morning. Good morning. God is good. Amen. Do you guys know the phrase, uh, God is good all the time? And all the time. We'll work on that later. But anyways, before we pray once again and dive into God's holy word, I just want to briefly touch, especially in light of the campers being here and the great Sunday school that they led, just want to touch briefly on this. Our vision is love, connect, share, thrive. And two weeks ago, we discussed what this section, this love section of the vision is all about. Then last week, we went over connect and what this section of the vision is all about. This week, we're going to touch on this and talk about more next week. Share what that portion of the vision is all about. And then after that, for the next two weeks after that, we're going to discuss Thrive, which is training others to disciple others, just as the campers are doing in Costa Rica. So that is the vision. That's where we're at. And that's the discussion portion. So once we finish with discussing it, and hopefully we're all clear on what it stands for, what it means, and where we're going, then it's going to move from discussion mode to action-oriented mode, as God leads and as God empowers. But just want to briefly touch, quick illustration, last week I told you that during prayer meeting two weeks ago, God moved in my heart in a very special way as a result of Dean's lesson, so especially in regards to sharing the gospel in, well, Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, which was Dean's passage for that evening before we prayed, he read this passage, which is, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did, not wa- I did not run in vain or labor in vain. And in going through that passage, Dean focused on this passage, among whom you shine as lights in the world. And from that, he pointed out a quote from J. Vernon McGee, which was this. When we go out at night, we see the stars up there. When God looks down on this dark world, He sees those who are His own as lights down here. And I don't know what that does for you, but God just used that to speak in my heart and move me to share the Gospel all the more. I just remember what it looks like at night. Well, on my computer screen, that looked a lot more brilliant. But anyway... (laughs) Just when you go out on a clear night and you see the stars, you see the wonder and the awe of everything that God has done just in those lights, it just fills your heart and it's just like, God, you are so great. Thank you so much. It just puts a smile on my face. And in thinking about that and thinking about McKee's quote and thinking about that scripture or verse, um, not only do we shine as lights amongst the people here, but in a sense we shine as a light for God himself that just as the city lights light up the night sky we with our evangelism sharing the gospel sort of light up the sky for God and for me it was like whoa it's not just a command that I have to share the gospel it's something I get to do I'm in a relationship with God so I get to bless God by being a brilliant light not, on a, not only on a horizontal plane, but on a vertical plane. And it was just, that just drove me. I was just like, wow, I get to love God that way. I get to give Him a picture of my love through sharing His great gospel. So that's what we're going through and share. We're going to talk about that more in, or more next week, dive into the biblical principles behind it, the way in which we're going to approach it. But that's where we're at. We're going to talk about it next week. Then for the next two weeks, Thrive. And then we're going from discussion mode to action mode. And not just talking about this, but doing it. So in light of that, right now, we're going to pray over this whole vision process. 
And then we're going to pray in light of God's word that we are going to read, study, and dive into. Let's go into a time of prayer. Dear God, you are great. And you are magnificent. And you are mighty. And it is just a privilege, an absolute privilege to serve you, to be amongst your great people, to be used by you, to encourage one another, to grow in our love for one another as we grow in our love for you. And dear God, we're embarking upon this this vision process. And in one way it's daunting, in another way it's encouraging, in another way it's challenging, but we're trying to do it for you. So we ask for your wisdom. We ask for your blessing. We ask for your guidance. Right now, in the quietness of your own heart, pray for God to direct you, to inspire you, to have a heart of unity that is moving forward together as a church. Ask God to direct you how you're going to take part in this vision process. Pray to your mighty God over this vision. God, you are real and you are active. You're active in our own life. You dwell within us if we believe in Jesus Christ. Your Holy Spirit is within us. And I pray, Lord, that we might never suppress your Spirit, but only enjoy what you have through us. Take a hold of that power as you guide us and pursue you, that we may love you more and encourage others to love you that we may connect with each other in such a way that displays You, that we may share You in such a way that shines for everyone around us, that it is undeniable that they hear who You are and that You look down upon us and are filled with joy at our obedience, at our love for You, and that we thrive. That we not only hold on to the ministry, but we give the ministry as You guide us and empower others to follow and love Jesus Christ. And dear God, right now as we look to Your Word, we want to be moved. We want to learn. We want to grow. Right now, check your heart. Ask for God to search your heart and remove any barrier to growth in Him. God, fill us with humility. Our spirit, our spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Remove distractions. Remove self. And fill us with you. Through your mighty word. Dear God, you are so good. Please continue, as you have in the past, today to work in us, and work in us as we approach the future. Dear God, you are so, so good. And we pray this all in the name of your mighty Son, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now will you please turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 14. And when you find Mark chapter 7, verse 14, if you're able and willing, will you please stand with me out of respect for the reading of God's Word. Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 14, reads, And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside a person 
that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him, since it enters not into his heart, but into his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared, all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of a man, of man, Come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a person. This is God's Word. Amen? Amen. You may be seated. Immediately prior to our passage today, Starting in chapter 7, verses 1 through 13, we saw last week the Pharisees and the scribes, they traveled over 90 miles, a couple days' journey, to do what? Not to sit under Jesus' teaching, not to enjoy and glorify God as a result of His miracles, but to confront, to attack Jesus. Why? Not because Jesus had broken any of God's commands, but because Jesus had refused, utterly refused to teach and enforce the commands of men, their traditions, their man-made religion. He refused to do that. They came along and accused Him of that, and He refused. He stood up to them, and He said this. Look in your Bibles at Mark chapter 7, verse 6, he replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Yet you, yet you have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. That's not just a slap on the wrist. That is a massive uppercut to the Pharisees and the scribes' way of thinking, the way in which they were approaching God. Their way of thinking, the way they were made right with God, was through ritual, was through the external, was through their man-made addition, their man-made additions of laws after law, after law. It was, a legal, it was legalism through and through. And Jesus says that is all vanity. That has not gotten you anywhere close to being righteous or right before God. That has done nothing for, for you. You are far from, as the text says, nowhere near being right with God. And it's after this harsh, direct rebuke that we come to verse 14 and look what Jesus says in verse 14. He says, hear me. He turns from the Pharisees and scribes and he turns to the crowd and he says, hear me. Or as some of your versions may translate it, he he says, listen to me. When I was a teacher, I can remember one day in particular, oh, this really stood out. Because after I let my fifth grade period class in, as they were sitting down, um, one student, as he was sitting down and class was getting ready, uh, decided to be extremely disrespectful, extremely vulgar, just sort of lash out at me. And normally... I'm a very relaxed sort of guy, (laughs) normally. Um, And even as a teacher, I was very relaxed, and it was more like, oh yeah, here we go through the motions and whatnot. But this was about the third or fourth day in a row in which this student was behaving this way, and it was time. 
So I walked over to my phone next to my desk. I called the office and said, there is a student that needs to be removed from my classroom immediately. And then between the time of that phone call and those people arriving to remove that student from that room, I made a beeline for his desk and slammed my hand on the desk and gave him a talk that made even the teacher aides in the room, it basically put the fear of God in them. <laughs> and after that talk, if you can call it that, and the people came to remove him from the class, I went from addressing him to turning to the class and saying, listen to me. This is what I expect of you, and this is what I do not expect of you. And that's sort of like what's happening here in this passage. Jesus has just rebuked the Pharisees and the scribes. He's addressed them as hypocrites holding on to human traditions and not God's commandments. They're leading the people astray. So he's rebuked them, and then he has turned to the crowd, and he's saying, listen to me. And from here, he makes it very clear what does and does not put a person at odds or against God. Look at what he says in verse 15. Jesus says, There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile, or excuse me, what defile him. Now when Jesus uses this word defile, he's not talking about, throughout this entire passage, he's not talking about physical dirtiness. All right, or uncleanness, physical dirtiness. He's talking about spiritual, in a way, spiritual dirtiness. What puts a person at odds with God? What makes them unacceptable? What makes them defiled before God's eyes? So when the Lord says, Jesus says in verse 15, look at it again, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. He's saying that the external things or actions are not the ultimate source of spiritual impurity. Another way to say that is what truly offends God. What truly offends God or puts a person at odds with God comes from within a person. Not from the outside in, but from the inside out, that the source of sin, our disconnect with God, is not external, but it is an internal reality. Let me say it another way. That the source of our sin that alienates us from God is not the product of our environment. It is not the product of our environment or even our action, but it is the condition of our heart that determines whether or not we are acceptable or unacceptable to God. David, King David, when he committed adultery, what did he do? He did not address the, how should I say it, the environment. He did not go to the porch from which he stood and saw, and saw Bathsheba and initially lusted after her and initiated that sin. He did not go to the porch and destroy the porch. He did not do that. He did not go to God and say, God, please destroy the porch. That is what is making me wrong or at odds before you. No, what did he do? He went to God and said, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. The source, the thing that puts us at odds with God is from the inside out. It is the condition of the heart whether it is right with God or not right with God. In Jeremiah chapter 17, when Jeremiah is addressing Judah, he's addressing them for their sin. He's addressing them and saying they're not right with God. But when he does that, when he points to the source of their sin, 
He doesn't point to their environment. He doesn't point to their education. He doesn't point to their parents. He doesn't point to their friends. He points to the condition of their heart and says, the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. As Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. So what is the source of, that makes us at odds with God. It is the condition of one's heart. It is the sin, the sin nature that we have within us. Or as John MacArthur says, external factors may provide people with unique opportunities to manifest their sinfulness. We would all agree upon that. But what this passage is talking about is the next part of that phrase. But the corruption already exists on the inside. We sin not because of outside influences, but because we are full of pride and lust. And when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. The outside provides the opportunity. But the product, but that is compounded, our sin happens when from the inside out, we act upon that product or upon that environment. And this whole fact, this whole discussion, this verse 14 here, when the listeners around Jesus would have heard this, they would have been absolutely shocked. We know from Matthew chapter 15 that the Pharisees and the scribes, they are irate. They are completely angry. Why? Because this goes against their entire thought process. They're concerned about the external. They're saying, you need to do the right ritual. You need to have, uh, you need to go to the synagogue every single Sabbath if you want to be made right with God. That is what is going to determine it. You need to have your prayer time set. Everything on the outside needs to be right. It doesn't matter what's on the inside. They had forgotten what 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7 says. God sees not as man sees, for man looks out looks at the outer appearance, which can be faked, but God looks at the heart, which cannot be faked. It's from the inside out. What makes us either right with God or at at odds with God is the condition of one's heart. They had forgotten Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 6, which Jesus says is the greatest command. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your might, and these words I command you today shall be on your heart. It's from the inside out. It's not from the outside in. But the Pharisees are all about the external, all about legalism, and they have it backwards. They're about the outside. That's what makes you right with God. But God and Jesus is saying no. What puts you at odds with God is not whether you complete the entire law, It's the condition of your heart. It's where you're at. That inner motive, that being, that soul. Where is that in terms of where God is at? And we as a a community, not only did these listeners and these Pharisees and these scribes have a hard time with this, but we have a hard time with this. I have a very hard time with this. I remember several years ago, I was so concerned about a specific item that I would not touch it. I would refuse to consume it. I would not be around it. It got to the point where it was alcohol, if you haven't guessed already, just because of a past culture or past sins of family. So I would not get touched. It was like if I touched a beer bottle, I felt like I was sinning. If I took a drink, I don't know if I could ever forgive myself. That item in itself, the external, was like, oh, if I do that, that's going to infuse me with sin and make me unright before God. But it's no, it's from the outflow of the heart. It's the motive. It's the means. It's from the inside out. So it's not that object that is evil. It is me that is evil from the inside out and using that object maybe in the future in the wrong way. Got so bad, one friend, he came back from Germany, he didn't realize where I was at with this at that time, and he had bought a various 
bottles of all the different types of beer from Germany. Germany, they love beer. And got all these expensive different types just because they look cool. And he thought the way that I would like the, the way that they look, not necessarily that I would drink them. And he gave them to me. And I struggled with it so much, I couldn't have it in the house. I had to take it out. I had to empty every single bottle. And then I had to crush every, every single one. I just couldn't take it. It was just so evil to me. But you know what? Intrinsically, those beer bottles, that alcohol, is not evil. That is not evil. It's what flows from the inside out. Basically, essentially, what my heart leads me to do with those items is where sin comes in to play. So that is where I'm at. And you know what? Even today, it's hard for me to do this. I'm still growing in this area. Yes, there is a point at which we consume alcohol. Let me just clarify. When you get drunk, that is sin. But even realize, when you get drunk, it's not the beer bottle's fault. (laughs) It's your fault. When you commit adultery, it's your fault. When you look at pornography, it's not the computer's fault. It's yours. Why? Because what defiles us comes from the inside. The condition of the heart. God's concern, primary concern, is the heart. Because you change the heart, you change the person, and then the acts of obedience that come and go on the outside are actually genuine. They're not fake. They're not works of self-righteousness, but they're works of righteousness because it's from a changed heart only produced by God. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Not saying, I avoid the external. My environment needs to be perfect. I just think of uh, Lot. Lot in 2 Peter chapter 3 is called a righteous man. And he is in the most horrific environment ever. He's in Sodom. There's not more than 10 men in the entire city. Yet it's not the outside influence that determines his standing before God. It's the condition of his heart. Was he perfect? Absolutely not. But his heart had been changed by God, and he was living for him from the inside out. So the environment from which we are in, or currently in, is not the determining factor that's going to make us right or wrong before God. It's the condition of the heart that enables us to act in a righteous way no matter where or when we are. And with that, oh, we're going to, I want you to notice in your Bible, go ahead and look at verse uh, 15, in which we'll ju- we were just in. I got a little carried away there. Um, <laughs> so, verse 15, you might notice in some of your Bibles, isn't there. Uh, or you might notice in your Bible, it's in brackets, or it's highlighted. Or it goes from, or excuse me, verse 16, excuse me, verse 15 to 17 in the ESV. And in multiple other versions, it does the same. And in either the end of verse 15 or the beginning of verse 17, there's perhaps a footnote. Or you have an old King James Bible and it's in brackets or something like that. And I want to quickly explain why that verse is not there in most of your versions. The reason why it's not there is because in some of the earliest manuscripts, that phrase He who has ears to hear, let him hear, isn't there. So the translators of your Bible, the ones who are putting together your Bible, are saying, you know what, we have such a high view of Scripture, and we don't want to say something in Scripture when it isn't. So we're either going to footnote it, put it in brackets, identify it, and say, hey, this is in some manuscripts, but it's not in the earliest manuscripts. So we're going to say it's there, but we're not going to say it's God's word. And that may put doubt in your mind, but that just reassures you, reassures me all the more to say, oh, our translators are not seeking to promote their agenda, though they cared very deeply about only portraying or giving the word of God and saying, this is the word of God and this is not. And you know what? Honestly, we're not sure at this point. The manuscript evidence is not definite. So with that, now let's go look at verse 17. It says, And when he had entered the house and left the people, 
his disciples asked him about the parable, and he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Stop right there. Remember that little episode with that student? And I rebuked the student. I turned to the class, said, listen to me. Well, the next month and a half, was that class was absolutely angelic. It was like teacher heaven. It was awesome. But after a month and a half, things started to prop up again. And on one hand, I was like, whoa, a month and a half, that's really cool. Especially for 7th and 8th graders. But on the other half, I was like, ah, it's three-fourths through the year. And you still don't get it. What I expect of you and don't expect of you. And Jesus has a class. And his class is called the Disciples. And he's been with them at this point for two years. And he realizes they're imperfect men. But it's sort of like, ah, come on. Why? You still don't get it. This is a basic, this is an elementary principle. God's primary concern is the heart. The external doesn't make you right with God. But I so thank God that this passage doesn't end there, that Jesus is patient with his disciples because I am a slow learner. And I would say I'm way slower than these disciples. So I'm so thankful for the patience of God. And he continues in verse 18. And he gives a physical illustration of what the overall topic that he's talking about. And he says in verse 18, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. This is a physical analogy, yet to prove the point again that the external that affects the body, whether the outside of the body or the inside, the physical, the external, does not determine your spiritual standing before our mighty God. And he gets very graphic here. It goes in the mouth and it just comes out the other end. All right? And it does not have a spiritual effect. The spiritual effect is what comes out of the heart, the heart of man, which uses those physical items in an inappropriate way way or an appropriate way and Jesus goes on from there and look at verse 20 it says in verse 20 and he said to them what come he gets very clear here this is the crystal clear moment and he said what comes out of a person is what defiles him for from within out of the heart of man come evil thoughts sexual immorality theft murder adultery coveting wickedness deceit it just keeps on going. Uh, sensuality, evil, or excuse me, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a person. You might notice that the first six items are acts, and the second or the remaining items, the second six items are processes that go on in the mind. And the idea is it comes out and it goes and it manifests itself in physical acts. In this passage, Jesus is addressing defilement. What makes a person at odds with God? Or what makes a person really at odds with God? And Jesus makes it very clear that it is not the external that puts you at odds with God. It is not what you physically put in your body that makes you at odds with God. It is the physical condition of the heart. And I just want to say this. What is the process of the overall heart? Everyone's heart starts out not as good and innocent, but everyone's heart starts out at odds with God. Everyone's heart starts in life at odds with God. It's a doctrine of total depravity, which comes from Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 3. And you were, this is speaking of before salvation, dead in trespasses and sins which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that has now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Or as reiterated in Romans 5.12, therefore just as sin came into the world through one man, 
and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because in Adam, all men sin. Psalms 51 verse 5, when David is confessing his sin before God, he recognizes that he was born in it. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. This is the doctrine of depravity. You don't have to tell a kid or teach a kid to do anything evil. It just comes about naturally. You don't have to teach them to do evil. It comes about naturally. Why? Because the condition of every single person's heart is initially at odds with God. That is the condition of everyone. For all have sinned. Paul can say that 2,000 years prior to us because he knows the condition of everyone's heart before they believe in Jesus Christ. And the Pharisees and the scribes were trying to fix the condition of men by working on the external. Saying, follow all of these rules, perform all of these rituals, and that will make you right with God. It's just like our society today. You see a horrible environment in which people are doing bad things. It's throw money at it, fix the environment, and you solve the problem. But the Bible story is very different. It says we all start out with a heart that is at odds with God. And the only person that is able to fix our heart is God himself. In Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27, speaking of the new covenant and what Jesus offers to everyone, moreover, moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of wait, that heart of a spirit. I will put my spirit within you. Titus 3, 5, and 6. He saved us, he eradicates our incorrect heart and makes us right with God. He saved us not on the basis of deeds, external matters, which which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing and regeneration and renewing by the Spirit whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Life, Or as my favorite passage says, there is therefore no condemnation, no more being at odds with God as a, result of the con- as a result of the condition of our heart for those who are in Christ Jesus. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin He condemned sin in the flesh in order that righteous, may- righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk according to the flesh, not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Jesus is very clear in this passage. Sin does not originate from the outside. Sin is within us. We have a sin nature. The condition of our hearts. And that makes us at odds with God. But praise be to God, because He does what we cannot do. And He, through the work of Jesus Christ, gives us a new heart from which genuine acts, true acts of righteousness and love for God flow. Today I'm going to ask a question, and it's, where is your heart? Where is your heart? Are you one that has not been changed and you're still at odds with God because You do not believe in Jesus Christ or are you one that has been changed? You have been given a new heart through belief in Jesus Christ and His works and His righteousness. I encourage you today, if you haven't already, to place your faith in Jesus Christ. And if you've already placed your faith in Jesus Christ, I encourage you to pray for others you know, as far as you know, who do not believe in Jesus Christ and ask God to give them what they desperately need, a new heart that only God can give them. Let's pray. Dear God, it's very humbling it's so against our culture it's so away so against the way we tend to naturally think.
sin is our problem. And it originates, it comes from within. And that's such sad news, but I thank you for the good news. The good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, who came to redeem, who came to take our heart of sin and wipe it clean and give us a new heart. Dear God, we're embarking upon a vision in which we want to share your gospel. May we make it clear. May we make it understandable. And may you make hearts clean, righteous before you, right with you. Dear God, you are so good, and we love you so much. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.